Hey church, just wanted to start off by saying how bummed I am that I'm not able to be with everyone at the start of this series, the start of this school year, uh, just for everything because I like being with everyone. I don't like missing Sundays. Uh, but I'm sure as many of you have heard, especially those of you that have subscribed to our newsletter and those of you that haven't, go onto our website and subscribe to our newsletter. We put out one every month and then only for like special meal trains or whatever. So it's not a ton of emails, and we would love to have you on there. Uh, anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, as you have heard in our newsletter, I am in quarantine. My family and I all got COVID uh, in the last week. We got it. Beck and I are vaccinated, and we got it from vaccinated relatives, which is super discouraging, but here we are. Everyone else is feeling mostly better. I'm I'm on, on the mend, but my voice might sound a little bit different. Ah, but before we get... Uh, too much further into it, I just want to start off by reading our framing passage for today. We're in Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. It says this, The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I implore your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think of your ways, I turn my feet to your decrees. I hurry and I do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. I really wanted to be with all of us as we start this series. We're calling The Hills We Die On. It's a series about our denomination, the Evangelical Covenant's Theological Distinctives. And I'm so excited to be doing this series with all of us for three reasons. One, uh, I think it's really important. If we are a part of a denomination, and we are, uh, this community needs to understand what that means, who we are connected to, who some of our giving goes to support. Uh, two, our denomination is fairly unique in how we approach non-negotiables, uh, and it profoundly informs how we as a community at St. Thomas engage with one another. And three, lastly, because there have been times when folks have not really understood who we are, what it is that frames us, supports us, provides flexibility and, and boundaries for us, and, and then those folks have found that frustrating. Uh, they have been frustrated by our lack of theological absolutes, uh, and have left the church. And rather than just try to let you go find that on your own, we find it important on a semi-regular basis to come back to these affirmations uh, to remind our community who we are and why we really will die on these hills uh, and why, as we work through this series, that might feel a little bit more tongue-in-cheek uh, than it sounds as we say that initially. But I think to do that, I want to start off with a little bit of a history lesson. And just a quick aside, because I'm not there today and because we wanted to really frame this series out well and give some good context, I'm going to preach a little bit longer than normal and we're not going to have a discussion. Uh, not because any of this isn't worthy of discussion, but hopefully because I've ranted enough that it's answered most of your questions. And by all means, email me or text me further questions or ask leadership team members. They might even be able to engage in that with you. But back to the history lesson. Uh, this might be a little bit of a taste of what some of what we're going to be doing in our catechism class in the next few weeks. Uh, it's starting next week and not this week because I am trapped once again in my laundry room. Uh, but I want to do a quick look over church history and to make a very long and complex story very short. Uh, we see Christianity from its earliest days have very few theological statements well defined. And as the church grows, the need to define things grows with it. And so we begin to have uh, what we call ecumenical councils. The first one takes place in Acts, the Council of Jerusalem. But there are many that come after it that seek to uh, define the nature of Jesus and the Father and the Spirit and what books belong in the Bible and how Jewish do you need to be Christian and all of these other questions. And these, these councils happen and the church grows and divides and splits over these theological statements from time to time. And the church kind of kicks people out that don't agree with these uh, distinctions. The first large genesitting, genesitting of communities uh, comes in 325 at the Council of Nicaea over the nature of who Jesus is. And uh, there are more additional councils that happen over the years, over the course of the next 700 years, that remove smaller groups of Christians from the church, the Church Universal, capital C. 
uh, here and there. But the next big split comes in 1054, when the Greek-speaking Eastern Orthodox Church and the Latin-speaking Western Catholic Churches kick one another out of the church, which is a thing to ponder. Um, but in that kicking out, we see, again, a season, a period of time where there's cohesive narratives in the East and in the West, and people are agreeing over these theological distinctives that have grown more and more and more rigid in the first thousand years of the church. But the next big split happens in 1517, we call it the Protestant Reformation. It's a radical fracture of the Catholic Church into many parts. And part of this fragmenting of the Reformation occurs because individual European nation-states and regions are begin beginning to identify with either Catholic sects and Catholic religion or Protestant sects and those that come out of it. And the result of this is even more specific theological litmus tests and nationalities being tied to specific theological beliefs so that if you are German, you are Lutheran. If you are Swiss, you are a follower, follower of Calvin. You're a Reformed person. If you are Scottish, you are a Presbyterian. And all of these things that happen coming out of all of this. And, and this is the case... Um, across Europe. And as these things happen, state churches rise up. So if you were born in a Lutheran country, you were automatically baptized into the Lutheran church of that country. And as you grow, your tithes are basically automatically taken out of your paycheck, that your taxes go to support the church and all that goes with that. And this is absolutely the case in Sweden, where our denomination come from. Uh, Sweden is a Lutheran country. It is led by the Lutheran State Church of Sweden. And over the course of a couple hundred years, some Lutheran Swedes began to feel that their faith wasn't impacting their lives or their communities in the way they thought it ought to. Uh, and so they sought a more transformative level of discipleship. Uh, this actually is happening all over Europe at this time, that the second and third and fourth generations after the Reformation find their faith less vibrant and as exciting as their parents and grandparents and those who have come before them and are looking for a, a revival movement within the church. And that leads many of them to this movement that is growing at the time called pietism. And pietism is this movement that starts in northern Germany and quickly makes its way into Sweden. And, and the goal of this movement really could be summarized like this that individuals within the movement read their Bibles. By reading their Bibles, that changes their behavior. By changing their behavior, they seek to be leaders in the church rather than just leaving that role up to the paid professional, cler professional clergy. And in doing that, they carry themselves in a humble demeanor and they hold their beliefs with humility and confidence. And so the covenant starts as this movement, a pietist reform movement of the Church of Sweden the Lutheran Church of Sweden, and, and that movement would have probably stayed in Sweden for a while, and, except that a famine came. And in this famine, uh, the church, most many of them, come to America. We land in Minnesota and Chicago and Illinois and Iowa begin to coalesce around the ideas of pietism uh, through the lens of Lutheran theology and, and form the Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant Church of America, which eventually gets boiled down into the Evangelical Covenant Church. Um, and, and really, as we do this, the goals of this movement move through everything that we are doing. They inundate what we think about being church, what we think about being people in this history, in this theological environment as a whole, and the ideas around pietism really come to coalesce in the covenant in how we engage in everything. Our founding question as early covenanters are going to sound really pious to you. Where is it written and how goes your walk? In other words, can you back up that belief that you're holding biblically and how does that belief impact your life? Because if it's not bearing good fruit, it's probably not a belief worth, worship, worth holding. And if it is bearing good fruit and it's biblically informed, then maybe it's something we should all carry with us. All of this theological and cultural background leads to the covenant being what I call a centered set denomination. It's not bounded set as other denominations are. A centered set versus bounded set is an idea that comes from math. Many of us are probably semi-familiar with it or very familiar with it, but it's an incredibly helpful belief in theology. A bounded set in math would be something like all whole numbers between 1 and 10. These are the bounds of the set. There are definitions of whole numbers, and there are boundaries of 1 and 10 and everything in between it. So in this set, there are 
10 numbers. This is not an infinite set. It is not infinitely large. And there are, there are clear ins and outs of numbers that are not in that set. 11, 13, negative 6, whatever. Uh, numbers that are in that set. 4, 7, 5. You know how math works. Um, but within that, we can see the opposite of that. There's such things as centered sets. So a centered set would be something like all whole numbers. Now, there are things that are still outside of these sets. Whole numbers are numbers without decimal points that are not negative or whatever. I'm not really a math person, so if my definition is a little off, you get it. But it is an infinitely large set with still boundaries that exclude certain things. But it is not bounded on the outsides, but bounded, you know, vertically and horizontally or whatever else you might call it. Whatever helps you visualize it. There are an infinite amount of whole numbers in the world, but there are numbers that are not whole. You actually can see this idea of a centered set coming in one of the foundational verses of the covenant as we are coming together. Psalm 119.63, I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. It's a centered set verse. We are friends with anyone who fears the Lord, not bounded by clear boundaries of those that fear you and worship on Sunday, those that don't take the Sabbath in this way. Or that we are just all who fear God. This is a centered, set identity. The covenant has continued this approach in our theological foundations. And this is what we actually call the covenant affirmations. There's six beliefs that we center on as a denomination. They are the centrality of the word of God, necessity of new birth, the church as a fellowship of believers, a commitment to the whole mission of the church, a conscious dependent on the Holy Spirit and the reality of freedom in Christ. Today we will look at the first affirmation, the centrality of the Word of God. Now let me tell you folks, I love this affirmation, both because of what it does do and because of what it doesn't. Because it doesn't fight over how inspired scripture is or what is inspired about it. For those that know the technical vocabulary words, it doesn't argue over inerrancy or infallibility. It doesn't check or fail to check the boxes of evangelical orthodoxy. But what it does say is this. Look, this is a book that has guided our movement for thousands of years. If we aren't keeping it at the center of our worshiping life, we have diverged from that movement. And that is the word I want us to sit with today, church, because for so many of us, we look at this book as if it is this dated, irrelevant, misguided text that may have been helpful in the past, but really isn't worth our attention today. But this affirmation, the centrality of the word of God says otherwise. Without making the Bible a God in and of itself, the covenant says that the Bible is a place that we meet God. It is a text that holds us to Jesus, that fights against our ego and our selfishness and our desire to make God in our own image. Again and again, scripture screams across time and across space and across culture. God loves this world and God loves humanity. Take care of it. Again and again, scripture screams across time and across space and across culture. Take care of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the sick. Again and again, scripture screams across space and time and culture. Die to yourself and give up on your insistence of individual rights and let Christ live through you so the kingdom of God may come. Again and again, scripture screams across time and space and culture. Quit seeing people as instruments to accomplish your goals and start seeing them as beings who are made in the image of God and in whom that image dwells. My pastor used to say growing up, you cannot read the Bible regularly and not come to a place of confusion or doubt because this was a book written for another universe. And yet, it is a book that by centering ourselves around its teachings, we actively bring about that universe and bring it into existence. It doesn't make sense to live in a biblical way in a world that doesn't reward it. And yet by living biblically, we recreate the world in the image of God as it was intended to be. Church, the kingdom of God is to come. If it is to come, it is to come and be a place that God would actually recognize. We must 
look at this book, the scriptures, as the guide to its creation. If we decide to create the image of God, the kingdom of God, in our own way, we will create another world just as messed up and just as self-centered as the one we live in now. We so often want to treat the Bible as a centered set that can only do so much. But the truth is, when we allow it to be unbound by our expectations, it becomes a truly dangerous and truly beautiful book that points to an even more dangerous and beautiful God. I want to close with an illustration from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Hear this. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan? said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king of the whole world. But not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time. But the word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment, and he'll settle that white witch. All right, it is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone, said Edmund. Oh, Lord love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do. And more than that, I expect of her. No, no, he'll put all to rights. As, to, as it is, as it says in the old rhyme in these parts, wrong will be right when Aslan comes to sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You understand when you see him. But shall we see him, asked Susan? Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you to where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man, asked Lucy? Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion. The great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie. And make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just all else silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver is telling you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good, and he's the king. I'm going to turn to Exodus 24. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called out to Moses from the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. When the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods for us. We shall go before us, and as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them and formed it in a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival of the Lord. And they rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. When I read this story, I used to think the Israels decided to create their own gods because they lacked faith in Yahweh or something. But, as, but if you read this story more carefully, you realize that the Israelites didn't create their own gods. They actually created a smaller version of Yahweh. Aaron says, these are the gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Up until this point, they've been told, Yahweh has brought you up out of the land of Egypt. It is not that they do not believe in Yahweh. It is that they are utterly, profoundly, at their core, terrified. Because they are sitting on a base of a mountain that is enveloped 
by a mysterious supernatural cloud that suddenly bursts into fire and seemingly consumes their leader, the prophet they thought they were following. He has not come back in 40 days. And they look at this mountain and go, that God scares the bejesus out of us. Can we create a smaller, safer, more controllable version of that God? Church, we do the same thing with scripture all the time. We do it with God, of course. That almost goes without saying. We make God small so that we don't have to be terrified. But we do it with the Bible. We bound scripture and we say, this is what the Bible does and this is what it can't do and this is how we should read it and this is da 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 We put so many boundaries about it to protect ourselves from the spirit of God that indwells that scripture and screams to us through it. But here's the thing. God, Yahweh, the God of the universe, is no safer than Aslan. And scripture is no safer than the Yahweh that we made in the little tiny gold calves. God is big, and God is doing big things through these books that we put together and call the Bible. A centered set God is big enough to worship. A bounded set is not. The covenant has foundationally centered ourself on the beliefs that when we do not put too many limits on who God is, God can be bigger than we might expect. Will you join me on this adventure? Because when we center our lives around the word of God, God tends to take us on some wild journeys. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the countless ways that you move through us, that you move in us, that you guide us. May your scripture come alive today. In your holy and mighty name. Amen.